Previously on the Retro Odyssey podcast. I'm just going to pick an old episode and re-air it. You better not. So my name's Adam, I've been playing video games since I was about eight years old. So it originally started with Amiga. Uh, I play the Switch at the moment, but I kind of focus most of my attention on retro stuff. And that's me, really. So, okay, well, I'm Ma- uh, next. Matthew Hudson. Um, sim- similar story to you, but, uh, pretty much. I grew up in the um, in the 80s with a Spectrum in the house, and... Um, that was our main gaming machine back then. Um, loads and loads of games for that, and always trading games with my friends as well. And then moved on to the Mass System, uh, Mega Drive. I had a SNES. I've had uh, I've had most of them. Um, N64, PlayStation. I currently have um, PS4 and a Switch. But um, I, I, I generally limit my, uh, my my gaming to PC gaming more often than not. Uh, but I do I do dabble in console gaming uh, every once in a while. So what do you normally play on PC? Like indie titles or like anything? Um, I, I, at the moment it's almost exclusively uh, World of Warcraft and Binding of Isaac. I do I do try and get some other games in, but both of those games are kind of like real time sinks to, uh, to, to, to make progress in. Yeah, yeah, you know the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I've put like several hundred hours into Binding of Isaac. I've put several hundred days in World of Warcraft. I've, I've been playing for um, nine years, I think. Days. Fair enough. Well, uh, Stephen, do you want to go next? Yeah, um, I'm Stephen Lambius. I've been playing games since I was about three, uh, when they handed me Super Mario Brothers. <laughs> um and I, you know, I grew up with the the NES, SNES, you know, all the way up, up the line. And I basically play everything. Like, you know, I I still have, you know, all my old systems. They all still work. And I have basically everything except the Sega systems. From that's you interesting, know, really, because over there you were pretty much uh, all Nintendo over there. Yeah, Sega didn't really have that much of a dent over in America. But yeah, over here it was kind of the reverse. It was, you know, Sega kind of ruled the roost and some people had Nintendo. Well, and I think part of that was a lot of the Nintendo games weren't localized for PAL at that point. So, I mean, I know, like, um, like Final Fantasy didn't go over there until 7. Really? So, I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, the, the 7 was the first time anyone outside of North America or Japan got a Final Fantasy game. All right. But, like, you know, I've got, you know, all the current systems, and I don't I, I don't have all the physical systems of the old ones, but I have a way to play everything. Like, I've got a backwards-compatible PS3, so that's how I play all of 1, 2, and 3. Yeah. But, yeah, because I, I, I like to expose myself to the, the wide variety of stuff because, you know, I, I want to see what's out there. So, you know, I want to... Yeah, so I don't like to limit myself to one thing. It's just you know, financing becomes an issue at a certain point. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, it's good to try like uh, you know things from different systems. All right, and Ryan. Been given for about since I was about four, three or four. So a solid um, going on twenty four, twenty five years now. It was, I, I vaguely remember my parents having an Atari when I was very, very small. And, uh, yeah, my dad would play pole position. But, uh, I grew up basically strictly Nintendo, uh, Nintendo born and raised. And we hit every, I, I, I had every single console from, uh, skipping the virtual boy, um, all the way from the top, I, foolishly still buy Nintendo every single time. 
<laughs> no, I, I wouldn't say it was a mistake this time around. No, not this time. This was this was great. It was a good option. I haven't been so impressed in years. Well, I yeah. Limit, I don't limit myself strictly to um, retro play, but I did discover about so. It was probably when the Xbox came out. We got an Xbox, and I would still spin around and go plug in the um, NES and the N64, and I would play that just as much, if not more. We had someone back in my hometown, which is a little itty bitty hometown in Alaska, where people would um, someone we, we they had a whole bunch of old games. And I bought like a Game Shark and all that stuff back in mid two thousand, and I just I was um, stocking up on old um any old games they had, which was not a whole lot. And it was about that time I realized, like, wow, I uh, I really like all this mess. <laughs> and I've just been kind of, um, I've just been kind of dedicated to slowly collecting more and more of it. I'm eventually going to go and build, like, an entire, I want to build an, an entire Nintendo build-out. Yeah. You know, a shrine to my uh, digital god. That, that's what I'm about here. So I think we should maybe go around in the same order, um, in terms of game order. So I'll start first and introduce my game and uh, say a little bit about it, and then open the floor as to what you guys think. So, as I say, my first machine really was the Amiga, although it belonged to my brother, and he had a few different games, like Football Manager and the like. But one game that caught my eye was a little game called Zool. Uh, so Zool, Ninja of the Nth Dimension, is a platforming game. It was made by Gremlin Graphics and came out in 1992 and has been ported to more or less everything. It was on the, uh, the Atari, the Master System, the SNES, the Game Gear, and I currently own it on the Mega Drive. So, as I say, it's a platforming game. You play as Zool, and he's a ninja who moves, shall we say, a little bit fast, a little bit floaty. And your goal is to collect, you know, various different items and things and eventually reach the goal. And you just continue on, occasionally fight bosses, and, you know, that's generally the gist of the game. So as a kid, I, I mainly played the first world, which is the Chupa Chups world, which kind of showed how bad advertising was, you know, even back then. And I don't think I ever got past that. So how far did you guys get? Did you actually play more than the first world, or did you just play that one? I got to the uh, to, to the second world. I kind of found, because of the uh, the control issues that I was having... I played like the first level of, of the second world and then thought this this really isn't going to get any better um, because I in the in the first world it kind of looks like ice on the floor and I thought that maybe maybe that's why I'm sliding everywhere but I was, no, no, also, I was also sliding all over the place on on like the second world as well you can see oh, yeah. the um, the appeal of the game I mean it's 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 bright and colorful definitely um, but the um, I, I, I just think if the control was a lot tighter, it would be a really, really decent platform. It just it, for, for me, the control kind of let me down. I mean, in fairness, he does seem to control like a ninja. He's he's really fast. He jumps really far, but doesn't really help when you're trying to do platforming on really narrow things. Right. Yeah. You know, when when you first look this up. It almost looks like nobody else got past the first world either, because all you see are pictures of that candy world. Yeah. Well, like the second one's the music world, isn't it? Yes. And then after that, I think there's a, a forest world, which you know is, is actually quite cool. Um, then there's one on like a toy world. And there's one that's a uh, like fruit and vegetables and things. I see one where you're riding on a snake. Uh, I don't remember that one. <laughs> they all just kind of blend together after a while because you just... That's the problem with it, the difficulty. After a while, you just kind of get annoyed with it. Yeah. And the appeal starts to grey. I think it's one of those games where you can play for, like, 
you know, maybe 10, 15 minutes, have a bit of fun, and then stop. I found I think, it to be um, rather frustrating on that part because it was super fast. And then yeah. was it like the – felt like about halfway through the first world, suddenly you're slugging through um, – I'm assuming it's supposed to be caramel with all the candy. Yeah, I think so. And you can't jump suddenly, and you're crawling along, and it just shifted the entire... Like, just as you're starting to get used to it, they changed the game on you. Yeah. Trying to shoot enemies is not the easiest thing to do, so I think it's just easier to just try and avoid them and jump over them. Yeah. I mean, So did anyone actually beat the first boss? Yes, I I, I, I did. Um, I found yeah. I found the uh, the boss easier than the platforming section before it. The yeah. the platforming section before it took me a good half an hour because you have all those uh, rivers that you've got to jump up, and it's really difficult to land on the platforms at the edge of those rivers. I almost threw my controller, but I didn't. <laughs> um, but I eventually made it to the bee, and I think on the third third attempt, I managed to kill the bee. Although I was save scumming at the time, because I, I have I have a um, Retron Five, and that's that's what I was playing the uh, the cartridge on. So it allows you to save on that, thankfully. Oh, otherwise, right, so otherwise I wouldn't have gone that far. Yeah, I mean, I kind of used a. I think there's passwords or something like that, so you can skip level, from what I remember. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was just basically getting as far as I could and then continuing next, you know, the next time because it was just too much. I actually looked into the whole um, Chupa Chups thing because I, I couldn't let it go when I saw like the sign I'm everywhere. Like, you know, and all the candy it was just yeah. too weird for what was supposed to be a ninja. So I actually looked it up, and it, I guess it just turns out the. Um, they were making the game, and they just ran out of money. Yeah, I think that's basically what it was. They, and they, and they, they just they ran looking, out of money and just got it. And they, Yeah, they were looking for someone to... Um, they were looking for someone to fund it and finish it, and I guess a lollipop company was the only one who was willing to back them. The interesting thing as well is that the branding is only in the first level. Yeah. Like, there's no branding on any of the other levels. But because the game is so hard that most people only see the Jumper Chups level. Mm-hmm. I would I would assume in that case that the game was already pretty much completed when they got this uh, the, this sponsorship and then they added the um, the Jumper Chups levels to the start. Although maybe because of the themes, probably it was a sweet level anyway. Yeah. And they just added, you know, all the Jumper Chups in the background. Yeah, yeah that's possible. It was a very weird experience. Yeah, it's it's very strange. As I say, I like the style of it, but I don't think it was particularly the best. Yeah, I mean, it, it's something that, you know, if I wanted to dedicate, like, you know, say, you know, okay, over this month I'm going to try and get through this game, like, you know... That like that, that's probably that's pretty much the level of commitment I'd have to have to get very far into it. Yeah, that's what I had to do to complete it, and I will never complete it again. Right. So, what are all your thoughts on uh, Zool then? For me, I have a fondness for it, but I don't think I could recommend it. So, I'd say it's basically it's fine. Play it if you're interested. It's pretty cheap. What do you guys think? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say that as well. Um, Weirdly, like the day after we uh, we were actually discussing it, I found it in CEX for like a tenner. So I thought, yeah, I'll uh, I'll, I'll pick it up. I think after playing it, the uh, the ten pound that I spent, I probably wouldn't have paid that had I um, had I played the game beforehand. I think maybe it's a solid five pound game. Um, you can get yeah. five pounds worth of enjoyment out of it, but. Yeah. Um, Purely, purely because of those controls, um, the very floaty and imprecise nature of the jumping, um, I, I definitely wouldn't really recommend it for, for for anything more than a few pounds, really. Yeah, that's that's kind of where I'm at. Um, I'm you know as 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 we'll get into you know as we go. I'm notoriously bad at platforming. 
So to have one that the controls aren't super tight is just even worse for me. All right, so Ryan, what did you reckon then? Unlike um, Steve and I have been playing the uh, platformers religiously, and it was excessively difficult because it was just so icy. I think it's a novel game at this point, and if you could pick it up for cheap enough, it would be worth trying just because it is kind of weird, and it is, I mean, it's honestly, it's really unique. It's unique enough from anything else I've played that I would recommend playing it, but only if you can pick it up for five to ten dollars, because I wouldn't spend more than that on it. Mm. So. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I only picked up for like a, you know, a few quid or something. Yeah. And it's probably not worth more. Uh, I mean, interestingly, they actually made a Zool 2. Although mm. I've never played it, so I have absolutely no idea if they improved on the on the controls. When I was when I was looking it up, it was uh, when I first played it. I'm like, man, this almost feels like it's like they like because like it was reminding me of Sonic the Hedgehog the way it was kind of um mushy and slippery. Yeah. I'm like, this, this feels a lot like Sonic the Hedgehog. So I played for a while, and I was looking it up because I was intrigued by the game, and it turns out it was made specifically to um, compete with Sonic the Hedgehog. No, it's not surprising. That so makes sense. Sell that, I bet. Yeah. Well, I think the, uh, the, the, the main difference, though, is that in, in Sonic, it does reward you for going fast. If you try and go fast yeah. in Zool, you're going to get yourself killed. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Looks like Zool 2 had a uh, two playable characters that you could choose from. Yeah, wasn't there a female ninja or something? Yeah, that's what I'm seeing here. Yeah. That'd be interesting to try it out. Yeah. Maybe it could be okay. Maybe it'll be terrible. No, see if they see, see what they learned from the first one. Well, yeah, definitely. Right, okay, so who's uh, next? Matt, do you want to talk about your game? The game I picked is Horace Goes Skiing. It's the first game that I remember playing back on the Spectrum. Um, I think we did have like a Pong console, but aside from that, uh, Spectrum was my first gaming um, system. And Horace Goes Skiing is one that I went back to quite a lot, probably because it's um, it's fairly short and easy. Um, so I did I did put a lot of time into that. Going back to it now. Um, a lot of it seems like quite luck based. It's, it's, it's strange in that the hardest part of the game comes at the start. And then the, uh, the skiing seems to be like a, um, a reward for doing the whole frogger section, which seems purely based on luck, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but it is, it is a game that I do have a fondness for, and I do go back to it every once in a while. Um, it's 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 a fun little time waster, but um, I think we should start the discussion on this game basically by asking, what kind of eldritch abomination is Horace? Because he's 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 not human. He's just a, a head with I think eyes and just limbs. Yeah. What what, 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 what even is he? I thought he was a skull. He, he I don't know, be, he, he kind of reminded be. me of E.T. a little bit. E.T., but ate all the pies. Yeah. <laughs> Fat E.T. But yeah, he's very weird. Um, but yeah, I have very strong opinions about this game. I didn't really know what to expect. Um, but I quickly fell in love with it. Um, like The first thing that kind of hooked me was the, the introduction when the title screen comes up. And there's this grating music that plays in the background. And, <laughs> and it almost tore my ears off. And I thought, this game has balls. I, I kind of respect it. Um, and then, as you say, it starts off with a kind of frogger sequence. But, you know, as you say, it's kind of look-based. But I actually found a bit of an exploit. Because if you go all the way to the left of the screen, nothing seems to hit you. So I always used to go all the way down to the left go down, get my skis, go to the left, go up, never got hit by traffic. Hmm. I'll have to give that a go. And then, like, after that, as you say, skiing was basically kind of a reward. Um, I never really seemed to notice a difference going between the blue flags, 
Uh, it just seemed to be much of a muchness. It, mainly yeah, avoiding the, trees seemed to be the key thing. But the, um, you, you, your points don't go up by going in between the flags, but they does go down if you um, if you hit the flags. All oh, right, okay. I didn't really work out the point of it because. I didn't seem to notice any kind of point bonuses, so I just assumed it was just optional. But yeah, I uh, I really dug it. After I um, figured out what the hell was going on with the controls, because my head is <laughs> everywhere, like I ended up having to take my keyboard and like prop it up sideways so I could access the D-pad, because most of the D-pad worked properly, except for like up. Up was... I think I concluded it was Y. So yeah, I had to remap all the controls because they were weird on the, um, uh, obviously the official Spectrum. I was using the real Spectrum and not an emulator. Uh, I had to remap the controls to make it play all right. Um, a, lot, a lot of the um, a lot of the Spectrum games tended to use the same kind of control, so it is something that I was I was used to. But I can see with modern control systems. It, it can be a bit mystifying. But once I once I got like my um, layout adjusted, because I was just playing in browser, it was actually not bad. Again, not a whole lot of um, not a whole lot to do. The uh, Frogger section, as mentioned, was probably the most brutal. But once I was past that, yeah, the um, skiing section just kind of felt like a reward. It was not, you know. The point system was relatively obtuse, but that wasn't the point to me. You know, I actually, I actually rather enjoyed it. Yeah, I, I thought it was a, a fun little game. I mean, like, like you guys have said, the the Frogger section was really kind of the meat of the game. What I found interesting was once I got through that, what what it really reminded me of was an old Windows game called Ski Free. I don't know if you guys played that one. No, I never had it. No, I've not. Okay. So Ski Free was an old, you know, game you could play on Windows. Um, it came with some computers. And it was just, you know, like it was just, a, you know, skiing down a hill. But there was this uh, this abominable snowman type thing that would always come and eat you. So when, when I saw Horace get to the skiing bit, I'm like, oh, this this looks very similar to Ski Free, because the, you know, graphics were very, very similar. But like you guys said, you know, the, you know, points I didn't really get, but it was just, you know, it's just kind of a nice, you know, weave around kind of thing. I, I, I thought it was a good little game, you know, like you said, a nice little time waster. Oh, hey, I think I've seen, I don't know if I've played it, but I think I've seen uh, Ski Free before, yeah. Mm. This is, um... Digging up something really old here. Yeah, like, it's one of those old games that a lot of people played and forgot about. I don't think I've ever played it, but looking at pictures, it does seem like a thing that I've seen before. Maybe mm. on, like, a YouTube video or something. Interesting. This is the first time I've even I've even seen this, so I've definitely not, not uh, played it. Yeah. Well, like I said, that's just, yeah, that's just what it reminded me of as soon as I saw it. Because, I, mean, I mean, if you look at the two side by side, you can see, like, you know, may, maybe I think Ski Free was made a little bit later, so the graphics might have had a little bit more detail on them, but, like, like I guess that's just that's what it reminded me of as soon as I saw it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a picture of the um, Abominable Snowman now. That is that is a strange... Is, is he carrying a knife? No. No. No, no I, think, I think he's just like, he just has weird-shaped hands. Yeah, he's just got weird shaped hands, and you cannot escape him. Like he will always get you. Right. So is that everyone on Horace? Um, yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I think I think that's about all I got. All right. So for me, I mean, I think the main thing holding it back is probably the system it's on. To be honest, is mm-hmm. you know, apart from emulator, there's not many other ways of playing it. Um, but I think if you've got access to a Spectrum, it's Probably worth picking up. It's, you know, it's damn good in my opinion. It's a, uh, it's a really common game as well, so it's really cheap. Mm. All right. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think, I think, you know, especially looking at when it was released, I think it's, you know, it's perfectly fine. I mean, it's worth mentioning it as well. It was one of the very earlier games of the Spectrum. Um, the Spectrum is capable of a lot more, but obviously, a lot of those earlier titles are going to be a lot uh, simpler. Right. Yeah. 
Kind of uh, like Boris uh, made kind of his own little Mario style franchise where he just did stuff. Yeah, because I'm I'm seeing other ones like that, and I'm also seeing a Horace Ghost scene for the Commodore 64. Oh, really? Wasn't there a Horace game that was basically Pac-Man? Yeah, that's, I'm yeah. seeing a picture of that. I'm seeing uh, Horace goes. Well, this one says Horace goes bipolar. I don't know if that's a real <laughs> thing. <or> <laughs> Yeah, I think the um, I think the Pac Man clone was the uh, first one, and Horace Ghost Hungry Skiing Horace. is the second one. Yeah, yeah. All right, nice one. Uh, all right, so Stephen, do you want to go next? My first game, you know, like I said before, was Super Mario Brothers, which was a lot of people's entry into video games at that time. I mean, I was born in 1990, so that was right, or you know, right at the height of Mario Brothers being a thing. But yeah, I mean, you know, it basically my grandfather would give me the controller and I'd play. And of course, you know, I was three, so I didn't know what I was doing. But, you know, we said first game, so that's that's the game I played first. Yeah. I mean, going going back to it in later years, it's, you know, I've, I, I've never been to the end of the game because I'm, as I said, horrible at platforming. And, you know, that game really, it, it just requires memorization, which was, you know, the whole thing in, in the old Nintendo Entertainment System days was you had to basically memorize the game to get through it. Because that whole difficulty thing. Mm. Like, I have played my fair share, and it was, Super Mario Bros. was also one of my very first games, as we had an NES. And, um, I won't sit here and say it's a great game, but I do hold it's with a lot of respect because of what it helped lead to. Yeah, it was a very influential, and it kind of opened the door for a lot of games that came after. I think what really sets it apart from uh, from earlier platform games is the fact that the platforming itself, in terms of the controls, is pin sharp. You can you you, you know exactly where you're going to land when you jump. The controls for me are what really really sold it and yeah it was it was iterated on in later games but at, at, at its core that is a perfect control system for platformers for me i really dislike the game i can't stand it i find it very boring but i've completed it like a few times but the first time i completed it was i think it was either on the wii u or the 3ds so it's an e-shop purchase I played it through and, you know, I did use save states because obviously on those versions it exists, so why not? Right. And, yeah, I didn't have the best of times with it. As far as games are concerned, it's actually not anything super special. It's just what it was at the time mm. is what is what makes it special. Yeah. You know, and the things it led to. I think you can say that with a, you know, a bunch of different games where... You know, the game itself is kind of influential and it did a lot of things. As a game, looking back on it, in itself, it's not that great. Well, that's like the original Legend of Zelda. It's not a fantastic game. It's, you know, I'd say good at best, but, you know, it's what it, you know, it showed what the NES could do. It showed that these types of games could be successful and then, you know, we see where we are now. Yeah, definitely. Right, so is that everyone on Mario Brothers? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, there's nothing that can be said that hasn't already been said a million yeah, times about that game, to be honest. I mean, for me personally, I'd say avoid it, unless you can play it for free or yeah. whatever. I mean, it's something to experience, but not necessarily enjoy. Yeah, you're not missing out on much. Yeah. Personally, for me, I would, I would honestly recommend it. I... I do enjoy it quite a bit, but again, better things came 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 later. But as a as a pure platforming experience, I think it works really well. But it helps right, as well that it's uh, it, it's one of the cheapest games on the system as well to to pick up. Yeah, I mean, you, you I mean, and I think there's like four or five different cartridges that have it because there's the cartridge by itself, the uh, Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt. Meyer Brothers, Duck Hunt, and uh, uh, I think it was like Decathlon or something like that. I thought it was, I thought it wasn't, I was thought it was, it was like, like Spike Bike. It was like World Games or something like that. I don't remember. 
And you can also pick up on everything as well. Like, it's, yeah. Yeah. if you've got a Nintendo console, you can probably play it. Yeah. Right, so I think that leaves us with Ryan, which, uh, you know, moving on to improvements in the series. Ryan will talk about that in a moment. Super Mario Bros. 3 was... It was... I'm pretty sure I played that before I played Super Mario Bros. It's really hard to say. I'm pretty confident that it was um, the third. And I... It's one of my favorite NES titles, straight up. But it really, like put a massive impact on me. I remember when I was little and I would play, like, the first two levels and that's all I would play. Yeah. And I would, like, inch forward one more level at a time and I'd get to the end of the world and I'd hit the reset button and I'd play it all over again. Because, I don't know, something about going and fighting the boss was like, nope, not going to do that. (laughs) I'm five and that scares me. But, um... It really just... It really just seated home where I wanted to be, and also probably why I'm decent at platformers now because I just just was ground the shit out of it. It's not you know, the easiest of platformers as well. It's got some interesting mechanics, and it's and it's also nice and tight. They kept with the nice tight controls that they birthed with Super Mario Bros. as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that and the um, visually, the game was just much nicer than honestly a lot of um, NES titles at the time. Yeah, they, with 3, they were really showing what they could do with the system. Well, it's not even fair, because they cheated. They put a processor in the cartridge. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's true. But they were pumping out they were pumping out more colors simultaneously than um, they were supposed to. Diagonal scrolling. Yeah, it was a pretty impressive game for the, it, for the system. It did a lot of impressive things, but it just, it just felt right as far as platformers went, and it really hooked me. Mm. Yeah, and I'll sit. I'll still sit down like, at least once a year and beat it. Thing is, it was a. It's a bit of a strange game, really, because I had seen you know videos of it before, and I always think of it as a SNES game because you know because of how good it looks, mm-hmm. and I always forget that it came out on the NES instead. Um, I mean, my first experience with it was actually on the the NES remix. Mm-hmm. So I only played like you know bite-sized chunks of it, mm-hmm. but you know it kind of interested me enough. So I was I was glad it was on the list because I'm not a fan of 2D Mario games, but Super Mario Brothers 3 was pretty good. I mean I didn't get very far on it or I died, but I remember for um, years my brother and I we weren't sure if the um, Super Leaf was a leaf or a feather because it didn't make any sense that a leaf would make you fly. Yeah. But then again, well, yeah, it's Mario, it so it doesn't be. have to make a whole lot of sense. Well, yeah. It's yeah. strange, but yeah, it's a good game. I think for me, it's um, it's one of if not the best uh, platformer on the system. Um, I, 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 think, I think it brought a lot of New ideas to the table. You had the um, the map screen, and you had choices of, of of which levels you could go. You've got so many different kinds of um, kinds of level, kinds of um, ways of playing the level. You've got levels that scroll themselves, levels that yeah, absolutely. you scroll, and um, and I think that variety kind of um, it just it just puts it like a level above most of the other platformers on the uh, on the system. From the yeah, variety of enemies, too. Yeah. Although, yeah. speaking of variety, can we talk about that boot? I mean, <laughs> it's nice that they put it in, but what was the point? <laughs> to stop the shit out of things, obviously. It's like yeah, my favorite it was, part of the game. Yeah, I mean, it's good, but they use it in one level, and that's it. It just kind of feels very underused. I don't know, maybe it was, like, somebody's idea that nobody else liked, and they're like, fine, we'll put it in one level just to humor them. <laughs> yeah, possibly. But I thought it was really cool. Yeah, I, I think you guys are absolutely right that Mario Brothers 3 is it, kind of a standout um, among, you know, the NES and, you know, what it did for the franchise, because 
I, I actually missed this game completely as a kid and went straight into Super Mario Brothers World. Or Super Mario World. So, you know, for me going back, I'm seeing a lot of the stuff that I'm used to from World started in 3. Yeah, yeah, it's... Um it kind of like informed a lot of the design decisions on um, on Super Mario World, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Super Most Mario of- World is is the better game of the two, I would say. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would have to respectfully disagree with that, though. I do, <laughs> I do have a special place in my heart for Super Mario World as well. Well, I've not played Super um, Mario World, so I can't really say. So I did find out that Super Mario World is the only true sequel of any um. Of any Mario games. That's yeah, as as story sequel, concerned. Then. Yeah, because uh, two was a dream and three was a play. So uh, World is the the only the second time he actually has an adventure. Well, no, it actually Super Mario World directly picks up after three. Oh, okay. I, I think it covers it in the manual where it talks about like. Uh, where it picks up, but it doesn't clarify because they obviously didn't weren't too worried about it at the time. It doesn't clarify if World is also a play, yeah, or if World takes place after the play, yeah, uh, okay. But it does clarify right after the events of Super Mario Bros. Three, and I always thought that was interesting. Oh, that's right, it does say that, yeah. So, and I, I have yet to see a uh, Mario game even if it is a sequel that actually clarifies that and it confirms that it is a true sequel rather than just another one. Right. Yeah. To be honest, I, I, I've never even noticed the stories in the, early, in the early Mario games at all. Well, the story is quite bare bones. Three is probably the first one that actually gave you any story that wasn't just in the manual. Yeah. And you get it with the um, talking to the kings... And then getting letters from the princess, they kind of you kind of get a vague idea what's going on. You can also get um, different messages. A lot of people don't know, but you can actually get different messages from um, talking to the kings if you finish up each airship while wearing, I think it's a frog suit, a tanuki suit, or a hammer suit. Yeah, you'll get a different messages from the kings. All right, I didn't know that. So, but, you know, finishing with a frog suit, I think, usually ends up with something funny, but finishing an airship with a frog suit is damn near impossible. <laughs> yeah. Right, nice one. So, Super Mario Bros. 3, would you recommend it? Yes, absolutely. Every day. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It, it, it's absolutely worth checking out. I mean, and it, it's another one of those that was just super influential. I mean, they made a whole movie just to announce it. <laughs> oh, yeah, The we Wizard. We don't talk about that, Stephen. <laughs> I, I had to watch that for spin for spin off doctor, so people are going to share my pain. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm actually currently halfway through that that particular podcast right now. I've been yeah. I've been listening to it on the way to work past couple of days. Yeah, I've not seen the wizard episode yet, so I've got that to come. <laughs> they they had some thoughts. <laughs> Rest in peace, Paul Hoskins. Right, so uh, next game on the list is the other Matt's pick, which is Zargon. Zargon. Uh, yeah. I don't really know enough about it, which you know, obviously Matt would be able to do, but um, it was made on the DOS platform, by the looks of it, and came yeah. out in 1993. It was one of those shareware games, so there was Volume 1, Beyond Reality, and then you had to buy Volume 2 and Volume 3. Mm-hmm. So the one on the list is actually Volume 3, Zargon's Fury. So, yeah, it's kind of... It kind of plays a bit like Zelda 2, more or less. Mm-hmm. You've got kind of a, a top-down overworld, and you go between different areas, and then there are side-scrolling bits. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was a decent game from what I've played. It's, it's kind of odd. He fires, like, these fireball things out of his penis, <laughs> which... Seems like an odd combat choice for <laughs> this warrior. Yeah. Um, but it but works. It works. It works. It does the so job. So how odd is it really, then? Well, exactly. If it works for him, then it works. I mean, I um, played it from um, from episode one myself. And um, 
I I really really enjoyed it. To to be honest, what once once I once I got my controller working with it, I had a lot of fun with that game, and I'm going to continue playing it. I'm also going to find a. Um, I'm probably going to muscle through some DOS box and see if I can get it working for once and um, actually download the game and play it. Yeah, me too. I think. Do um, go to the menu and read the story. It's I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I don't really know what the story is all about. I just kind of, you know, played a little bit of it. I think it's this guy who needs to just, you know, destroy Zargon. I think it is. The the um, um, the instructions at the start of the game do make a point of saying that he is very cool and muscular. Well, that tells you everything. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think I'll go back and uh, you know try to work through it. Um, I didn't get very far into it, but that's because I was you know that I, th- I think that was the last one I tried that day after doing all the other ones that were frustrating. Oh, one thing as well that I found interesting was the how the combat worked. Because not only did you have the penis laser, but if you hold up and down, the bullet arcs upwards or downwards. I didn't find that. Yeah, I only discovered it by accident, and I thought, oh, that makes the game easier than I was finding it. In I started from the beginning, and like the third level, they mention it. Yeah, yeah, it's on, it's on one of the posts. The box is like, hey, by the way, you can totally... Um, Bend your bullets, like, taken or some shit like that. All oh, right. I was only doing it from uh, episode three. So that was probably why everything seemed to happen all at once. It was like, here are all these enemies. Now go and find a key and open these doors. And overall, I felt that Zargon was a, um, or is, a very, very solid, I mean, it's, it's a platforming game, straight up. Yeah. I thought it was a very solid game, especially back on a um, DOS platform back in the day. I really do have a um, a special love for old DOS music. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, every single MIDI sound is identical. Yeah. So all the music sounds exactly the same, but I just love it. Yeah, I think I think it was definitely very solid. It, it's uh, definitely worth checking out. Yeah, I would say the same thing. I mean, I don't know how much it would cost, you know, buying the physical copy, but yeah. because it's a DOS game, I don't think there'd be any other solution apart from playing it on DOS box, to be honest, these days. Yeah, it's the thing, like, you know, like, I, mean, I mean, even even back in the, you know, 98 to XP days, you'd have a hard time getting this thing to work. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that one was more or less a, you know, winner. More or less, it's a, a solid recommendation. Yeah, yeah, ab- absolutely. Apparently, the um, they're setting three new Zargon games: one for Android, one for PC, and there's going to be a 3D FPS for PC, Xbox, and PC. Uh, yeah, and PS4. All right. Interesting. Uh, I okay, that, so I'll, that they'll go and slip in like the original Zargon into one of those then. Yeah, probably. That'd be quite good. One to look out for. Yeah, definitely. BJ Puff. Mm. Uh, yeah, I wasn't a fan of this game. I had a bit of difficulty. It seemed to... It could be because I was playing it on a browser, but it seemed to be quite slow and quite difficult to do anything with. I watched quite a bit of um playthrough of it because I couldn't find a working copy, and other than my eyes were bleeding from the colors, and yeah, Jesus, it did appear to be very slow and um, chuggy. Mm. It doesn't help that there's um, no music in the Spectrum version as well. You get you get um, sound effects, but that that's it. I think the um, I, I, I actually played two different versions. I played the Spectrum version and the C64 version. The Spectrum version has nice-looking sprites, um, but the lack of music and the control, where it seems like a lot of times you can't avoid taking hits, um, yeah. I found it just really, really boring. But the, uh, the C64 version, the sprites are really ugly, but it's in full color. And it's bright and colorful, and it looks better because of that, and it controls better as well. Plus, it has mm. music, but it doesn't have sound effects. So you've you've got um, you've got like a trade-off there. 
I would I would definitely recommend the C64 version over the Spectrum version, but honestly, I probably wouldn't recommend either. Yeah, me neither. No. I mean, I, you know, I, I uh, think it was like one of the first areas I jumped down into this thing with these tiny platforms to get back up. And, you know, you've got to do this weird, like, run and run back and jump to climb up. And I, I, just, I couldn't get back. Yeah. I honestly couldn't even recommend watching footage of the game because it, <laughs> it's so bad. Yeah. But it's that's why this, that's why this was uh, first games and not uh, favorite games here. Yeah, yeah, that's that's safe for the next time, which hopefully that will be uh, a little bit better. Based on our game list, I'll say it should be significantly better. Well, yeah, definitely. Right, so Castle of Dragon. It was made by Setter Corporation, who I've never heard of before. Hmm. Um, I have no idea what else they made. But judging by the system, it's saying things like Nosferatu and <laughs> Morita Shogi 64. So it was made on the Nintendo Entertainment System in 1989. And it's basically Castlevania, but shit. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably the best way to describe it. So as for a plot, I don't really know much in terms of a plot because I can't find any kind of um, information about it. But from what I gather, it's some knight trying to save a princess. Maybe there's a dragon involved, judging by the name of it. Yeah, I think th- I think there was a little scene in the beginning where a dragon picks up a lady in a dress, takes her away from a castle, and then you start the game. Yes, yes, yeah, it was. That's, that's it punched right in. in. Yeah. So, what do you guys think? Good. It was it was horrible. <laughs> Why Why are all the enemies so fast? They move so fast. Yeah. Why do they take so many hits? Like, is it, is it if the first or second level, they just throw, like, a wizard against you at the very end? That might be the second level. Uh, I don't know. I didn't get very far on this. I they found throw- it almost impossible to, you know, attack people and avoid avoid hits. Yeah, they throw a wizard against you, and he'll walk up, and he'll take a few steps... And then he'll like throw like a um, like a wave of fireballs at you, mm-hmm. and then he'll take a few more steps. But one of them, I walked up to him and started wailing on him, and then he just started walking towards me, and he killed me from contact damage because I couldn't get away. Yeah, there was nothing I could do. Yeah, I think the uh, the main problem is that um, your own attack is so short range, and yeah. whilst whilst you can block you can't block and attack at the same time. So right. you've got to be standing right right next to the enemy to to attack them. And obviously, as soon as you attack them, they're attacking you back. I I wasn't able to kill a single enemy without taking damage myself. Yeah. Yeah, I was the same. Like, I did slightly better each time, so I got a little bit further, but after a short while, I didn't want to get any further. Yeah, I was just very... Not impressed. It was it, like even just the small amount I was able to play just was a very frustrating kind of thing. I thought I was going to get all smart and cross up one of the um, one of the enemies because he was running at me. So I go to jump over his head, and he just spins around and runs right under my feet. Just yeah, moving bonkers fast. It, it's the game isn't even fair. No, it's not. There's no like proper way of combat. I mean. The game tries to ape things like Ghouls and Ghosts and Castlevania, but in those games, it's actually fair, the combat, whereas did, this is just stupid. Did anybody figure out what the blue bar was? No. No. Okay, because I had that blue bar, and I thought it might have been, like, magic, but I couldn't figure out how to cast any magic. I mean, interestingly, I, I, I did I did look at someone else's uh, playthrough of this, and there does seem to be a ranged attack. But I couldn't figure out how to put it off. I mean, do it. the 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 NES has only got two buttons. One yeah. of them's jump, one of them's fire. So how how, how do you do this? Yeah. yeah, it's not select. So I think that's actually how you pause the game. And why is the guy bright orange? That well, seems he's judging him for his skin color. That's what I'm yeah. saying. He seems to be a little bit weird. 
He seems like the son of, you know, Donald Trump or David Dickinson. He spent a little too long in the spray tan. Yeah. Just a little bit. Maybe just like spray tanning. In general, the art style isn't terrible. It actually looks all right, but... um, Yeah. Yeah, Good luck luck getting to see it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, exactly, because you can never get far. All you see is, like, the outside castle walls. The face on the beginning where it pops up the um, title screen reminded me of a little bit of Gundam... Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Sure that was like helmet. I don't know. This game was just a waste of time. Yes. Yeah. I definitely wouldn't recommend it. I don't know if it's an expensive game to get on the NES, but it's not worth it, even if it's like a couple of quid. I mean, I've played some. Pr- we had some pretty terrible NES games back in the day, like the um, uh, the Predator game was just awful. It was so bad, and. Uh, Actually, it showed here. I used to have it. I might still have it, but Destination Earth Star was just a bizarre game, but it wasn't good. Yeah. Right, well, looking at Castle of Dragon on the NES, it seems to be going for relatively cheap, like 10 euros unboxed. That's, um, that's nowhere near cheap enough. That's not nearly no. cheap enough. I mean, if you want a box copy, you're probably paying about like 40 quid. Jesus. Which that's absurd. Is- yeah, you don't want to be paying that amount for this. No. You don't want to be paying... Even if you get unboxed copies, that's not cheap enough. Yeah, In right, a matter of fact, showing. I wouldn't take it if it was free. Yeah, they're showing about $12 used. Okay, so I think that's a unanimous avoid then from... Yeah, that's, it, yeah. That was, yeah absolutely. it has no value at yeah. all. RetroOdysseyPodcast.com to find our latest episodes and all of our social media links.